evening and a very warm welcome to yet another episode of Who's Who in the Bible, Praying with Biblical Characters. And today, we're going to look at the Apostle Philip. Let me begin with, will the real Philip please stand up? Why do I say that? Because not in the scriptures, but the commentaries that came after the scriptures tended to confuse the two Philips. Philip the Apostle and Philip the Evangelist or the Deacon. They are two different characters. Philip the Apostle appears only in the Gospel. He figures as one among the twelve. But the other Philip, the Philip the Evangelist, Philip the Deacon, he appears in the Acts of the Apostle as one of the seven deacons, not one of the twelve apostles. And so the one that we are going to look at today is Philip the Apostle. And for that, I'm going to read a text which deals with the call of Philip, and it is found in John chapter 1. Verse 43. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. And Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Our gracious Father, we thank you for the many gifts you give us, most of all the gift of your son Jesus, who has come into the world to reveal your face, your heart, your presence. You not only send your son Jesus, your son calls us into communion with you through the Spirit and with him. We ask your blessing on all those who participate in this episode. That as we look at the Apostle Philip, you will also throw light on our lives so that we too will be faithful disciples missionaries and witnesses to your presence, your love, and your life. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Philip. Another name like Andrew, which is Greek. And the root, the etymology of Philip's name is philos and epo which means a lover of horses. I don't know or don't suppose that everyone named Philip or Philippos are lover of horses. Well, things are not always what they sometimes see. My name, Juventus, means youthful in spite of my white hair. Philippos. As a fun fact, let me also add, Ipos means horse, and the word hippopotamus means a horse of the river. Because Potamos means river, as we know from Mesopotamia, the land between two rivers. Well, fun facts aside, where does he come from? He comes from Bethsaida, the same place that both Andrew and Peter, and also the sons of Jeb Zebedee, James and John, appear as well. Now, Bethsaida was a small little town by the Lake of Galilee. Again, by means of this Greek name, it shows that his family was open to a cultural reality beyond their Jewish world. Now, in the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the name Philip appears seven times in the list of the 12 apostles. But we find that he appears four times in 
the gospel according to John. Here in the gospel text that I read for you shows his interaction with Bartholomew, Nathanael, who's known as Bartholomew in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now, we don't have a list of the 12 in John's gospel, but we do have characters who appear, who figure out among the 12. For example, we come to know more about Andrew, and Thomas, and of course, Philip, whom we are looking at today. So let's take a look at the first of the four appearances that we have of Philip in the gospel according to John. The first one, as I said, is John chapter 1, verses 43 to 49, where Jesus looks for and finds Philip. And he says this simple, straight, direct words, follow me. Probably Philip had already heard about Jesus because he came from Bethsaida, like Andrew and Peter and James and John. But to know that he was called was a reason for being enthusiastic and excited. And he's so full of it, he wants to share that with others, just as some of us do when you read a good book, see a good film, go to a good restaurant. We want to share it with others. We want to recommend, we invite them. And that's what Philip does in this gospel text. He goes to Nathanael, and he points out Jesus to him. He says, we found him, whom Moses in the law and in the prophets wrote about. In other words, he's making a statement that he is the fulfillment of what was there in the scriptures. He is the one that they were waiting and looking for, the Messiah. In fact, in the gospel, gospels generally, but particularly in John, we see how there is a fulfillment. Jesus is the fulfillment of what was prophesied in the Old Testament, whether it's John chapter 5, verses 39 to 40, or John chapter 19, verses 36. And of course, when we look at Luke's gospel in Luke chapter 24, as the disciples were walking on the road to Emmaus, Jesus tells those two disciples, was it not necessary? Because he's speaking about all that the law and the prophet spoke about is now fulfilled in the life of Jesus. So that's the point that Philip is indicating to Nathanael. What is Nathanael's response? Well, here is Philip all excited, but Nathanael seems to show a sheer indifference or a mere disinterest. Ha, even worse, he reveals a prejudice. His comment is, Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Because for him, the answer was no. Because the, for him, the center was Jerusalem, as it was for many of the other people who lived at that time. Not some lowly or unholy place called Nazareth, but Jerusalem, because that's where the temple was, that's where the priests lived. But God surprises us. Not from Jerusalem, but the Galilee of the nations. Now, to, to that response to Philip, Philip is not offensive, neither is he defensive. All he says is, come and see. He's inviting him to look at the person of Jesus, not with the eyes of prejudice, but with the eyes of faith. So he invites him to have a real experience. Because Philip himself had experienced Jesus, and so now he was witnessing to Jesus. And what is fascinating is the more he grows into the person of Jesus, the more he begins to utter the words of Jesus. Because the very words that Jesus said to Andrew and the other disciples, come and see, he now utters to Nathanael, come and see, come and experience. Don't prejudge. Because when you meet somebody face to face, not behind their back, with an honest lens, not with twisted eyes, those prejudices are going to fall off. And when you live close to someone and grow in intimacy and friendship, because remember, 
when Jesus called his disciples to be with him and then to send them out. But it meant to be with them was to grow in a personal relationship with someone who was your brother, your friend, your teacher. Now, what I'm going to propose is, as we're going to look at these four events, the first we just looked at, is also a parallel journey that is taking place in the life of Philip, of a deepening of a faith journey. We've, just to give you a quick preview, we've just looked at the personal call. Next, we are going to look at the multiplication of loaves, where that will be a step farther, further in his faith journey. Then we are going to look at the Greeks who come to see Jesus and how does Philip respond to them. And then finally, we'll have Philip saying, show us the Father. And each of these four steps show how Philip is growing in his relationship with Jesus, growing in his relationship in faith. Having looked at the call of Philip, we now move secondly to that interaction with regard to the loaves and the fish, which we find in John chapter 6. Verse 5 and the following. When Jesus looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Then, of course, it goes on to tell us of how there was the multiplication of the loaves and fish, and it fed so many people, and so many baskets full of fragments were left after that. But what, what do we see in this situation? You will find a lot of similar events in the life of Philip, as we have already seen in Andrew. And this is another one. Jesus has fed the people with his word, with his proclamation. He's nourished their spirits, their hearts, their minds. But he also wants to feed their bodies. And that is why at his initiative, he decides to feed these people. They didn't ask for it. But he's not going to do it alone. He's going to involve his apostles, his disciples. And so he does a kind of a brainstorming. And this brainstorming is trying to find out what can be done, where can resources be got, how can we do it together. Of course, what's the response of Philip? Even half year's wages won't be enough and even that will be too little. Well, you might say that Philip is a realist. He's a practical man. He might have a warm heart, but he's quite a pessimist. He has the vivid sense of the impossible. Of course, Andrew, on the other hand, is looking around, as we've already seen in looking at Andrew, the proactive man who manages to get a young boy with loaves and fish, and the rest is history. It feeds a multitude. Because Jesus takes, he takes resources from what is already there, within and without. Takes it, blesses it, breaks it, and distributes it. That's always how Jesus works in our lives. He invites us to collaborate with him. And that's what he was doing over here. And so the loaves and fish in Jesus' hands becomes multiplied over. And what is Philip going to learn from this? Because through this event, it's not just a multiplication of loaves. Jesus is now going to announce, I am the bread of life. What is more, Philip is going to realize his horizons of faith are going to be broadened in his faith journey. Because now he's going to see whatever is left in the hands of God, in the hands of Jesus, are going to be something marvelous and miraculous. Because that's the safest place to be. Which now takes us to the third event where Philip appears. And again, it's something that he appears together with, with Andrew. John 
chapter 12 and the verse 20 onwards. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip who was from Bethsaida in Galilee and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew and then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Again, you see a lot of similarities. These seem to be working in tandem. Both at the previous incident, but even now. So there's a lot of similarity in what we looked at with Andrew and a kind of a repetition with what we are seeing here with Philip. What's the background? Some of the Greeks approach Philip. Who could they be? God-fearers, proselytes, people who are not fully into the Jewish faith, but who had come nonetheless because it was the Passover in Jerusalem, come to worship there, to be present at the temple. And having heard of the name and of the person of Jesus, they're looking for someone who could take them there. And here, someone with such a Greek name, they probably could make that connect. And so they come to Philip. And Philip, you could say, he looks for his country cousin. He goes and finds Andrew, again with another Greek name. And both of them take these to Jesus, serving perhaps as translators and as interpreters. What I raised up when I looked at Andrew, I want to raise up again even now. The question that might be in the minds of some of you is, why would Jesus need a translator or an interpreter? Isn't he God? Doesn't he understand every language? Well, God does. But you must remember that Jesus was truly God and truly man. And therefore, when he takes on a human flesh, the incarnation as we call it, he embraces fully the human condition with its efforts, with its struggles, with the limitations, with the fragility, the tiredness, it's part of being human. And so, because he takes his humanity seriously, he doesn't pull out his God card when he's in a tight spot or a difficult situation. He accepts the reality of being human. And that's why you would say he never even escapes from the reality of the crucifixion by pulling out his God card. Now, we are in the area of probability. Jesus certainly would have spoken Aramaic and Hebrew. Maybe as a carpenter or a tecton, the word used in the text in Greek, a workman who would have had some smattering of Greek, but not enough to have a conversation or a dialogue. And that's where Philip and Andrew would have come in. And so they, Jesus speaks, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it will bear fruit only when it so happens. He's referring to the growth of the church that will take place beyond the confines of a Jewish world to a non-Jewish, what they call the Gentile world. And you could say this is a kind of an opening. Another step in his faith journey where Philip serves as a kind of a missionary to these Greeks who want to meet Jesus. We move to the last stage of his appearance in the gospel according to John, and that's John chapter 14, verses 8 and the following. Philip said to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. What's the background to this text? It's John 14. So Jesus is saying, I go to prepare a place for you. 
And so Thomas says, show us the way. And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the life. And then Philip says, show us the Father, the text that I read you. And Jesus says, if you know me, you know the Father. Philip is really trying to be helpful. You know, he just show us the Father. We're not bothered about the other details. Show us the Father, that's enough. But Jesus is taking him deeper into this faith journey. It's like somebody in a classroom, you know, you want to ask a question, you think maybe it's not good enough, maybe it's foolish, maybe it's stupid. And finally you say it. And the others are relieved because they also wanted to ask that question but didn't have the courage to do so. Philip had. And out of that question, it became an opportunity for Jesus to explain further his own personality his presence as God, but more than that, his relationship with the Father. What the Father means to him. How close he is with the Father. How identified he is with the Father. You know, in the Old Testament, there was, can we see the face of God and live? The answer is not always very clear because how could you see the face of God in human terms? You could see the, the glory, the Shekinah of God. And that's what Moses yearned for. But here, now, we get to see the face of God. You see the face of God and live. Or even better, we live because we see the face of God. With Jesus, God takes flesh. And therefore, Jesus is the face of the Father. In fact, Paul will write in Colossians 1.15, he is the visible image of the invisible God because now we can see the face of God because to see me, as Jesus says, is to see the Father. Thanks to Philip, Jesus spells this out clearly for us. And an answer that's not just an academic answer or a theological treatise, but it's a relationship that's personal, intimate, and up close. The come and see that we heard earlier now becomes come and experience. Experience the Father through me. We are grateful to Philip for that. What more do we know about Philip? Where did he serve? Where did he minister? Where, do we di where did he die? Very little is known honestly about it that can be verified. There were a lot of legends, there were a lot of traditions. One significant tradition was that he preached in Syria, in a place called Scythia, in Eurasia, and of course Phrygia. And it is in this province of Phrygia, western Turkey, that he was supposed to have died in Hierapolis. How he died, what they say he was tortured, but some say perhaps he was beheaded, stoned, or even crucified. Again, this is in the area of tradition. It is not verifiable. But the important thing is, what can we learn from Philip? I'd like to take you through some of them. First of all, his call. Many he was surprised, even shocked, when Jesus comes to him directly and says, follow me. And he must have said, me? You really want me? I'm not worthy. I'm not capable. To know that you are chosen, to know that you are loved, is a wonderful experience. Philip had that. Despite his sense of feeling unworthy, not meriting it. Isn't that what we feel sometimes? That we are called by God. Each one by virtue of our baptism. We are loved by God. Philip knew that experience and that is why he couldn't keep it to himself. He had to take it to others. He had to tell others, and he certainly did. He did it with Nathanael. Which brings me to a second point, what we can learn from Philip. Nathanael, when he was presented by Philip, the person of Jesus, his response was rather cold, quite cynical, prejudice. Can anything good come from Nazareth? 
Interestingly, the word prejudice, prejudice, which means prejudgment. And his response is, just come and see. In other words, experience firsthand and face your prejudices. Because what happens with prejudice is usually behind the backs of people that we say. We see a reality with twisted eyes. Maybe there is both the personal prejudice and there is a group or a community prejudice. The personal prejudice is when, when we feel hurt by someone or we hate somebody, we just turn indifferent and everything we see about that person is in a negative light. We can never affirm, appreciate or thank that person because of our personal prejudice. Sometimes it's a community or a group prejudice. We have prejudices among other, against other people. Depends on which part of the country or the world they come from, what language they speak, what region, what caste, how much wealth, what education. We have these kinds of prejudices. Or the servant class, you put them down with servile class. Our prejudices manifest themselves in so many different ways. We see one aspect and we generalize. Something has happened in the past, we keep a record forever. Prejudices. Scratch a little bit under our skin and we will find prejudices within ourselves. But the painful thing is we recognize better the prejudices of other people, never our own. And when we have the honesty, humility and the courage, we can face our prejudices. It's not rationality or logic when it comes to that. It is an experience. And that's what changes Nathanael. Simply because Philip, all he said to him, come and see. Philip was the catalyst, the facilitator for Nathanael to come out of his prejudice. What else can we learn from Philip? Is we can learn a sense of teamwork. The Greeks approached him first. He could have said, okay, this is, this is my project, this is my baby. No. He looked for Andrew and together, as a team, they took the Greeks because the mission is big enough for everyone. It's not just a personal or private limited company. What else can we learn from Philip? We see the deep faith experience. When we looked at John 14, show us the father. He's yearning for something more. He's not satisfied with the mediocre religious experience or a spirituality. He wants something more. And so he's not satisfied with, as we would say today, being a Sunday Christian, being the, the least or the minimum aspect. He wants something more. Show us the Father. And that enabled him to have a deeper relationship with Jesus and with the Father. What else can we learn from Philip? I pointed out at the very start that Philip was making a deep faith journey. I quickly want to recap. First of all, this personal call. He experienced it beautifully, a personal call, and then he immediately becomes a missionary. He goes to Nathaniel, come along. He can't keep it to himself. The second step, the feeding of the multitude. They were faced with limitations. How can we feed so many people? But with God, Philip realizes, with Jesus, all things are possible. His faith begins to increase. The third is the Greeks come. He now has a sense of mission. He, do we, like Philip, take others to Jesus? Sometimes through our word, but always by our witness, our lifestyle, the way that we commit to Jesus, the way even without opening our mouths, just the attitude of our life will reveal the face and the heart of Jesus. And the last aspect that we see is he shows, he asks Jesus, show us the Father to be in union with God. His sense of prayer that is so deep, more than just saying prayers, we need to pray, to be in union, in communion with God. And when that happens, God opens our heart to the world. And the more we are open to the world, the more we will be rooted in the heart of God. That's the faith journey. 
that Philip made through the pages of the gospel according to John. And in that we see two dimensions of our Christian calling. Jesus says, come. And in the same breath, he says, go. The call to come is to be his disciple. The call to go is to be a missionary. The one who will witness. You and I can learn much from Philip. His journey of faith, of being a disciple who witnesses, of being a missionary disciple. We thank God for his life. We thank God for his witness. And we pray that the same will be reflected in your life and in mine. And so we give glory to God as we pray. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Thank you for being with us with yet, for yet another episode of Who's Who in the Bible. Spread the word around. Let others know. May they also experience the riches of the scriptures that come to us through the Bible. Good night and God bless you all.